You'll notice a few verses earlier in this same chapter of our gospel read in Matthew chapter 13. You'll see in the midst of the red lettering that there is some black lettering which lets you in on the fact that there is somebody that's speaking other than the Lord. And that which is said in this spot that the Lord is not speaking is a question that is asked by the disciples in verse 10. He said, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? You see, this wasn't the first time that Jesus had spoken in parables. This was a common way that he had of communicating the message of salvation delivered from heaven and that he, in fact, was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. He is the promised Messiah. But the way in which he presented that material was not a normal thing for which they were, with which they were familiar. Now, while there is many similarities between the Proverbs of the Old Testament and the parables, there was, uh, this was a different type of arrangement whereby truth could be communicated. And thus, they asked the question. And the answer that Jesus gives in response to the question that they ask is somewhat complicated. He said, I speak in parables to reveal the truth, and I speak to those who wanted the truth, to those who were the friends of the truth. Uh, have you ever heard the truth presented in such a simple fashion that you delighted in that? Well, that'd be a pretty good indication that you have a proper appetite for the truth. At the same time, the same means whereby the truth was communicated on this occasion resulted in the enemies of the truth not being able to see. What's he talking about? Why don't he just speak plainly to us? Well, he was speaking plainly to us. But it was the proverbial, they would not have recognized themselves, themselves had, he drawn, had he drawn them a picture of themselves, and he did draw them a picture of themselves, and they didn't recognize it at the same time. Isn't that amazing? The same mechanism of communicating truth and two widely divergent ways in which that truth would be viewed. And yet that's not something that went out of existence with the first century, obviously. It is something that we have to deal with on a regular basis today. In our earnest desire to present the gospel in such a fashion that no one could possibly say that it was impossible for them to understand we find the same types of problems even today. Some will not see it because they fit in the category of described by Jesus here in verse 15. Their eyes are closed. You can't see it because your eyes are closed. The story is told of a, two men who were told that there, were, uh, there was a barn full of rats. And... One of the guys, the braver, I guess, of the guys, he went to one side of the barn and he said, Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the other side of the barn and I'm going to come loud and, and beating on a, a pan and I'm going to run the rats right by you and I want you to make sure and look and see if you see any rats come out of this barn. And so he went through the one side of the barn, making the office racket, came through on the other side and he said, Would you see anything? And he said, No, I didn't. And he looked at him, and he had his eyes closed. He's like, hey, of course he didn't see. Now, when it comes to the message that is absolutely essential for us to know and do in order to be saved, then that is a very sad condition that one would be in, in having his eyes close to the truth, in having his ears stopped to the truth, of being the one who has the hard, fat, hard heart that cannot be penetrated by the truth. That heart condition, friends, is a whole lot worse than having to have five or six or even seven bypasses. A whole lot worse. It is a heart condition that will result 
in the eternal damnation of an individual soul. And we must, absolutely must, not be guilty of having that type of heart condition. Would it surprise you if I was to tell you that there are more people who, in the United States of America, are afflicted with what is commonly referred to as a disability of being unable to hear sufficiently or even deaf than all other of those types of disabilities combined? More people in the United States of America are afflicted with that disability than any other. As a matter of fact, out of the 49 million people in the United States of America who are classified as being disabled, 28 million of them have a problem with hearing. Now, you can sort of see where this lesson might go then if we want to be talking about those who are incapable of hearing, as most people can, in our society. I mean, you take heart disease, you take cancer, you take kidney disease, tuberculosis, and blindness, and put all that together, and it doesn't reach the level of those who are impaired in their ability to hear. As a matter of fact, when you put another number on it, 12% of the people in the United States of America have a problem hearing. Their hearing is impaired to some extent, and some are just plain old deaf. And this is something to look forward to if you happen to be reaching an advanced age, whatever that means. Of those 65 years old and older, only 9.5% can hear good or not impaired. Less than 10% of people over, somebody, I heard somebody say, huh? <laughs> oh, less than 10% of those 65 years old, years old and older can hear without any problems hearing. So here's a real, real problem. Now, would it surprise you that the Bible has a whole lot to say about this matter of hearing and the purpose that he placed uh, an ear on each side of our head? Think, for example, these verses of Scripture. The wise man Solomon in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 12 said this, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made both of them. Well, obviously so. But, but, but what about those ears that don't even hear? And what about those eyes that don't see? He said they're not fulfilling the function for which they were created, are they? And one is just as hazardous as the other. A failure to see when that's what the eyes are for, and a failure to hear when that was, that's what the ears are for. The Jewish Shema, which is uh, referred to by Jesus himself when asked relative to the greatest uh, commandment in Matthew chapter 22, it begins like this, as recorded first in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. Now, there's an emphasis on hearing. The children of Israel of old had the responsibility, and this would have the impact of bringing them together in realization that each one of them lived by this motto, by this creed. Hear, O Israel. Pay attention, all ye who are the descendants of Abraham through Isaac through Jacob. The Lord our God is, in fact, one Lord. How many times do we see throughout the Old Testament a prophet stand up and saying, Give ear to what I'm saying. What are you talking about, give ear? Do you want somebody to hand him his ear? Or do you want them to hear? To use their ears for the very reason that God created those ears. And, of course, the same fact of the matter is, is we can easily see that from time to time, we find those who are reprimanded and sometimes just plain old rebuke because they don't use their hearing as they should. You ever heard of somebody being dull of hearing? Oh, right here. Those who have their ears stopped are dull of hearing. And even first century members of the Lord's church is addressed in the book of Hebrews could not take in information about Jesus being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek because they themselves were dull of hearing. 
it did not make the impact in their lives that it should because there was an absence of real perception on their part. Now, is that because they were born with that problem? Or in exercising their free moral agency, they refused to use their intellect as well as their hearing as the way they should. Well, obviously, it is the latter. When Jesus would say, He that has ears to hear, let him hear, who's he talking to? Are there just a certain segment of society who have ears to hear? Or does that describe everybody? Everybody should have ears to hear. Not just ears to balance out your head. Ears so you can have something to hang your glasses on. But actually have ears for the purpose of hearing. And then when you read the parable of the sower, and it just so happens that the parable of the sower is found in the first three gospel accounts, you find a pretty good three-point sermon, which is the basis for this sermon here this evening. In Matthew chapter 13, in Mark chapter 4, and then again in Luke chapter 8, we see that while the first part of this parable in each of those accounts is the same, the ending and the words that are used in the ending of each one is a tad different, enough different to warrant a point one, a point two, and a point three. And that is our lesson this evening. You see, if you put those three summary things together, it reads something like this. There are three attitudes that should prevail when it comes to fulfilling our responsibilities as the proper good soul in the parable of the sower. Those three are this. Take heed, from Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 9, take heed that you hear... Then in Mark's account, in Mark chapter 4, at verse 24, take heed what you hear. And then in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 8, verse 18, take heed how you hear. Now, a little subtle difference in those three accounts, but different enough for there to be many things that we can say about each point. But we're going to say just a little and not a whole lot about each point. Let me spur from Matthew's account, take heed that you hear. Now, the idea of taking heed, of course, is to give in proper point of emphasis to something required. In this case, take heed that you hear. Now, isn't it amazing that you have to point out the very purpose for there being ears to begin with? Why did God create man with the ability to take in information by way of words through his ears? Did you realize that when all is said and done, the main reason why man has the ability to do that is so that he can take in information about salvation through his Son, Jesus Christ, and thus avoid the horrors of eternal damnation. Everything else is just extra. That's the main thing. The reason why we can hear is so that we can avail ourselves of the opportunity to hear the message of Jesus Christ before we pass from this earthly existence. There is nothing more important than hearing that. Therefore, if I fail to hear, then I fail to do the very reason why I've got my ears. It's why I have those ears. Is hearing really essential to man's salvation. Well, let's think about our ending to every lesson in which we use powerful and every lesson in which we don't use powerful. The plan of salvation begins with hearing. Or ain't going Is it not because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God? Isn't it the case that if a person does not become a believer, then he is doomed already? Well, certainly so. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And that's another way of saying you can't please God without faith. Well, upon what is that faith based? Well, if it's not based upon what you hear, and what you hear being the Word of God, then it's based upon something that will not suffice in the after a while. 
It does matter what we hear. And we are to hear. Take heed that you hear. In the absence of that, then you can forget about the rest of God's plan of salvation. If a person does not hear, then he's not going to believe. If he doesn't believe, he's not going to repent. If he doesn't repent, he's not going to confess. And if he doesn't confess, there's no need for him to get wet. Well. Where does it begin? It begins with hear. Take heed that you hear. How many people do you reckon listen to God's Word on a regular basis? Look at how many people, even when there is a radio station that's working in Dunlap, look at how many people listen to the genuine gospel being preached on the radio. How many should listen? How many should pay attention when the truth is presented? Well, everybody should. How many should not pay attention when something else is presented? Everybody Hearing is absolutely essential. It's impossible for us to become what God wants us to become, which means becoming a Christian, if we are not willing to hear. Now, sometimes, you you think about it this way. Somebody here in a a jewelry store, they have a a diamond or a piece of gold or, or maybe even a shiny coin. And they want its beauty to be on display. What do they do to it? Do they just throw it out there and set it on a piece of cardboard? Or do they maybe put it on a background of, of black or blue or red velvet or something? And it makes it shine. It makes the contrast there so clear that it catches the eye. It makes just a little old rock look like really something in contrast to the black background or even a gold. Reckon that contrast and that with a backdrop of what this world claims to offer and what it really does offer would make the simple presentation of the gospel a little bit more presentable? I dare say it would. What is the backdrop for what we do? What is the backdrop that would heighten our appreciation for the simple proclamation of God's Word? Is it a chore for us to study our Bible lessons? Is it so difficult that we simply cannot find the three minutes necessary to read a Back to the Bible article in the Tribune of Joppa? Is it really that terrible? Before we started putting the articles in the shopper and in the Tribune, and by the way, that suggestion came from Sutton Campbell. As my fact, Sutton said, we need something in the paper on a weekly basis presenting the truth because there's too much garbage out here being taught. We need to preach the truth in that, by that man. And he said, I'll pay for it if the elders don't see fit to pay for it themselves or with the congregation's money. Would the contrast that really does exist between that message and what's presented as if it is a saving message that the world buys and swallows up line sinkers, should that not have an impact and an emphasis in our minds and in our lives? Certainly it should. You know, one of the things that those in the area of, of hearing problems know about, and, and I know a little bit about that, not because of, I, I can't hear good, but I know from, from the standpoint of Tammy. And her having to have uh, uh, surgery on her ear. That there is such a thing as background noise. Now, I never knew anything about background noise. But it's those things that interfere with what you're really wanting to listen to because there's all this other stuff out there and it's hard to distinguish between the two. It's that background noise. It might be the television going on or a siren down the road somewhere or who knows what it might be. But it's something that interferes with being able to hear what really is the point of emphasis that needs to be heard. They didn't call that, don't they call it white noise? The noise that distracts may even be nothing more than the little old silly song in an elevator or the dinging of the bell in the elevator. That background noise. 
does that background noise get more attention than God's Word when it comes to our appetite for what we hear? Is it trying to get our Sunday school lesson while at the same time watching the ball game? Hmm. You see, if we want to remove these things that would hinder our ability to hear, then obviously we could do that if we so desire. When we take away those distractions, then, and only then really, will we have the opportunity to see the pure beauty of God's Word. Take heed that you hear. In the absence of that, there is no hope whatsoever for us. But notice secondly, from Mark's account, Mark says, take heed what you hear. What do we listen to? Do you realize there are so many competing voices in the world today all saying, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. There is the cry from the political correctness crowd. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Don't use language like short. Use terminology like vertically challenged. Don't say things like, well, I'm not going to say it. Because I want to be politically correct. Don't use terminology that is degrading, like calling a female who carries the mail a male man. Call her a male woman, which seems to me to be a contradiction term. Political correctness. And whatever you do, don't call sin sin. Don't call drunkenness. Sinful, refer to it as alcoholism. Don't call an illicit sexual relationship adultery. Call it an affair. Find easier names to swallow than what things actually are. Political race. That's not the only crowd that's trying to get us to pay attention. The Hollywood crowd, the uh, crowd of intellectualism, the crowd of scholasticism, all these people are vying for our attention and vying for our time, and far too many people want to listen to them above and beyond listening to God His Word. Take heed what you hear. Do you think there's maybe people today who would give more concern and place more emphasis upon what the world is saying than what God's saying? Well, just take a gander at what they do on a regular basis. It's very obvious who they're trying to please, and it's not God. It's somebody else. And any time people are in the business of pleasing somebody other than God, rest assured those people that they're trying to please is not going to do them any good whatsoever come the day of judgment. Was it not Jesus Himself who stated in no uncertain terms that if we believe not that He is, that is, He is the promise of Messiah, then we would die in our sin. John chapter 4 and verse 24. And did not the Hebrew writer say in Hebrews chapter 1, beginning, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son. God speaks by and through His Son. He speaks to us by and through inspired men who were guided into all truth. The reference is made by Jesus to the apostles in John chapter 14. 15, 16, and 17. Therefore, that is what we need to give heed to. Paul would say in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 17, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it's possible for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect. The idea of our being complete, truly furnished, or thoroughly confurnished, unto every good work. God's Word has the ability to do for us what we need done. It has the ability to provide for us what nothing else can provide. Therefore, it would be foolish to go to anything else other than what God says on the matter. And hopefully we'll illustrate that conclusively in just a discussion this morning about elders. Friends and brethren, the principle that we sought to show of the facts of relative to elders this morning applies to the totality of every other thing that we must deal with. What must I do to be saved? How am I to conduct myself as an employer? How am I to conduct myself as an employee? How am I to 
live in a world of sin. All these things are addressed in dramatic detail in God's Word. Take heed what you hear. But then notice as well. Thirdly, take heed from Luke's account, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Now we're going to try to do some comparisons here and draw from the situations that oftentimes exist when people have a hard time physically hearing. Now, one thing that we certainly don't want to happen is for those who have a hard time physically hearing also being the very ones who have a hard time spiritually hearing because they got a double whammy going against them. So. Maybe if we could remove the one, then that would help remove the other. For example, practical, practical sage advice, I'm convinced. If you really want to hear, you have to work at it. Now, if you're a person that has the ability to hear, even though you are impaired to a certain extent through a loss of good hearing, if you can hear better when you read lips, then by all means look at the person that's talking. Huh? Well, now, would that principle not apply as well from a spiritual standpoint? If you are spiritually hard of hearing, should you not also look at he who is talking? In the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, after the Hebrew writer, Apostle Paul, in the 11th chapter, has held up the example of the Hall of Fame of the faithful. In spite of all the difficulties those individuals, male and female, young and old, face, they remain faithful. And then in chapter 12, it begins the idea of seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us, let us, Continue to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And the example that Jesus himself set. Would it not be a wonderful thing for us to keep our eyes clearly on Jesus? Some of the eyes said, well, we can't look at Jesus. I mean, you've done talked about how that poor woman over in Russia, she had a picture of Jesus above her bed, and, and, and she'd sit there and she'd look at that thing at night, and she'd say, oh, I'm so thankful I can look at this picture and look into the eyes of God. That's not the idea. The idea is looking at the example of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 2 at verse 9, the Hebrew writer says that Jesus, for the suffering of death, was crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And that this standard should be that on which we view regularly. But we... See Jesus. I mean, like a picture? No, the example of Jesus is a testimonial to us on a regular basis, on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Enduring the shame and went and sat down on the right hand of God on high. Looking unto Jesus. Take heed how you hear. Now, if it was possible in the first century, then also it's possible today for people to turn away their ears from the truth and be drawn into Bible. Right? That's obviously not hearing the proper way. We need to keep our focus clearly upon the one who's doing the speaking, both spiritually and also physically. That is, if we want to hear, we want to hear. Another thing. Our attention needs to be upon the one who is doing the speaking. The example a few months ago, if we really do want to become more knowledgeable of God's Word when we are supposedly engaged in a devotional period with our Bibles open, it would probably be best if we turn the television on. Huh? It might even be best if there is no ball game that we're getting information about at the time. And if it's after the children are gone to bed and we're not having a family devotion, then it should be our wholehearted attention 
to find all that we can about our particular course of study for that evening. In James chapter 4, verse 8, when, when James wrote, Draw nigh unto God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Is the idea of our being physically getting closer to God? How do you do that? Since God is in heaven and that's us, then that means that we go to the top of the mountain as often as we can? Is that the idea? No. We draw nigh to God by drawing nigh to the things that He's drawn nigh, that He draws nigh to. Our attention is directed at the things that He draws our attention to. His Word is what we hide in our heart that we may not sin against Him. And it is that closeness that removes the distance that exists between the speaker and also the hearer. An amazing thing that's oftentimes not recognize is that when it comes to the presentation of God's Word, whether it be in a Bible class or whether it be in a preaching, listening aspect, at some point in time, the responsibility is taken off the shoulders of the preacher and is transferred to the shoulders of the hearer. Huh? You see why it's a wonderful thing to be able to depend upon nothing but the truth to be presented. As far as nothing but the truth being presented, the only way that's going to benefit me as a person in the pew is if that truth that is presented has a specific effect in my life. The story is told of a, a legend among the Japanese that goes like this. Here's an individual who is taken into heaven. And as he is being given a tour of heaven by some angel, he notices there are boxes, just piles and piles and piles of boxes. It just so happens that one of the boxes that is piled up has the lid off of it. And he looks in the box and it looks like mushrooms. He says, what, what is all this about? What, what are these mushrooms doing here in heaven? To which the angel responds, oh, those are not mushrooms. Those are ears. Because hearing is as far as any impact was made in the lives of these individuals, and thus only their ears were saved. Sounds sort of foolish, doesn't it? But yet did not James write in James chapter 1 and verse 22, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, Deceiving your own self. When you think about that concept there of self-deception, do you realize what's essential in order for that to take place? In order to deceive your own self, that means that you must tell yourself a lie, and then you must believe the lie that you told yourself. That's self-deception. James says if a person is a hearer and not a doer, he lies to himself and he believes the lie he's told himself. Now that's not a very nice place to be. Jesus would say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then there comes the wise man's song. The wise man is the man who hears and does. Well, the foolish man, whose house fell flat, is the man that hears and doesn't do. Take heed that you hear, take heed what you hear, and take heed how you hear. How do you hear? Do you hear good? Do you hear indifferently? Do you hear with feet on it? And action is the result of hearing? Friends and brethren, that is the only acceptable way for us to hear. May God help us to not be the proverbial stopped ears and closed eyes and fat hard heart that cannot be converted. But help us to have the intestinal fortitude, as it were, the guts, to accept the truth and make the necessary change in our life if need be made. 
If you've never been obedient to the simple commands of the gospel, and are not at this very juncture in your life a child of God, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, a member of the Lord's church, then why not make those necessary corrections this evening? Believing that Jesus Christ is who He claimed to be, repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ, be baptized into Christ tonight. The Lord will add you to His church. Maybe in times past, that's what you did. But you've wandered away, and you need to be restored. The repentance, confession, and prayer, the way back is provided for the Aaron child of God. Would you come? While together we stand and while we stand.